ultimately, yeah. that's why we're all here is to build cultures that we thrive in and to really build something special for the companies we work with. I know, Mark, obviously you're involved in community for your company. Mm -hmm. uh, Mariah, you are the face of RP since you are the first person that anybody talks to for the most part. I'm curious to hear from the both of you because certainly this is far more your worlds than mine. What do the both of you do to really facilitate that impression that is reflective of the communities that you're representing? That's a good question. I can jump in. I think that each company has its own character, right? And the one as a previous job seeker, it's pretty, it, there, it, you can tell from just observing certain things, a little bit about the character of the company. And you can also tell when it's disingenuous. And so I think that being able to identify that character of your company and enrich it and not try to force something it's not is super important. And I think people see through some of the BS. I'm interested to hear what you, what you think about that, Mariah. I agree. Absolutely. Both as a previous job seeker and as somebody who, who meets with a lot of job seekers, first of all, I know how shitty the market is right now. And so what I like to do, I, I have this opinion, by the way, that the best you'll ever be treated by your company is as a candidate. So if you're having a bad interview experience, it's indicative of what your employee experience is going to look like. And so I, RP has an amazing culture where I, we are a different type of company. And I like to set that expectation from jump, right, with the interview process. So I follow how we have our culture. I start off by saying, this is what we're talking about. I set some expectations on the front end. One, that it's going to be a casual conversation because interviewing is a two-way street. We're both getting to know each other. And you're 100% correct. People can tell when you're being disingenuous. And I think you can tell a lot by how the person on my end, right? Your interviewer is responding to your questions. Are they giving you details? Are they giving you examples? Or are they really just saying the same thing that maybe their website says or that their job description says? Because it means that they don't actually live uh, a lot of what their culture is supposed to be. Yeah. I love that notion that the best you'll be treated is during the interview process. Because I think that's true, especially I have heard so many horror stories of companies where during the recruiting or interview process, you get wined and dined, or maybe in a remote first world, that's not happening to all of us. You get treated really well, and you're told all the things you want to hear. Uh, but then that may or may not be reflective of the actual employee experience, right? And on the flip side of that is if you're just not treated well, or if you have a bad feeling during the interview process, then maybe it doesn't align and you shouldn't feel obligated to move through a recruiting process or work for a company that you're not going to feel good about. So ultimately, you should feel good where you work. You and spend for those, so much time with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and oh, we'll get into all the fun stories that you have, Mariah. For those who don't know, uh, my name is Cameron Collins. I'm a revenue operations strategist at Rev Partners. I also serve as community manager for Sprocketeer. We also have my co-host, Mr. And Mark top Lerner. LinkedIn voice. Top LinkedIn yeah. voice. Director of Growth Marketing at Deal Hub. And then our guest today, Mariah Sumner, who is not only in charge of all things face of RP as our lead recruiter, but she is the has. And to the point that you made earlier, Mariah, being genuine in all fronts, why don't you go ahead and tell everyone what being our TAS is for those who don't know? Yes. So that is officially, that is the talent acquisition specialist. That's my job. But if I'm quoting the the great Will Smith, the, the British one, not the American one, it also means that I am the absolute shit, apparently, which I'll take. I'll take that. But that means that what I do is I create all of the back end work for our jobs, right? Understanding what it is that we need, creating those job descriptions, reading resumes, helping candidates through the interview process after they interview with me and even truly hopefully making that offer. So that's, it's a lot, it's a lot more than you would think that it is. And as our resident Taz, our, our talent acquisition specialist, if you will, uh, and so much more, uh, we're going to be covering a lot of really fun stuff regarding hiring and employment and really just what that looks like in the HubSpot space and just the greater RevOps scene as well. So we've got a lot of really exciting themes that we'll be covering, including stuff that you've experienced, both horror stories and wins during interviews, 
what you look for in candidates, and then just some of the questions that you tend to get that can help other people to prep for interviews and such. So, you know, one of the things that we had had in the show notes beforehand is when it comes to industry versus RP and what are some of the ways that you help to elevate the interview experience when it comes to just working with RevOps or HubSpot related candidates? Like, where do you start? Yeah, I think, first of all, I start with a moment of vulnerability, right? And I state, I have a memory that is weaker than my ankles. And if you know me, you I have a terrible memory. And so I also say that to say, I'm taking notes. If I don't write it down, I will forget. But that's also part of our piece culture. And that's really great for me. And so I always know I'll be looking at this screen over here, but I'm still focused on you, right? Because I need them to know that, one, we take notes. And two, that it's okay to not be perfect, right? It's okay to have a terrible memory. But from there, I also really just, I like I said, I keep it conversational. I tell them that it's casual. It's both of us getting to know each other. And I think that is what RP does, right? We want to get to know you as an entire person. we not just an employee here. And I want to showcase that. And I think a lot of people who have worked at HubSpot companies or have HubSpot experience are in honestly any industry and not calling out just HubSpot are used to only being an employee. They're, they're, you're valued for the product of your work. And RP is so much more than that. And so I like to do what I can to showcase. Does that answer your question? It totally does. And and the moment of vulnerability, I think, is is a really cool thing for you to do because I've had some referrals come into RP. But on the flip side of that, anyone that's ever spoken with you and me having gone through the recruiting process, I could say it's always appreciated when you have a recruiter that really feels like a human or a talent acquisition specialist that feels like a human. And then even trickling up from there, going into management that aren't just asking you technical questions are important, but knowing that um, this has to be a good fit for both parties, right? That's really important. And Mark, I know that you obviously talked to a lot of different people in a lot of different communities, and I'm curious to hear what are some of the things that when it comes to just being human, you find are some of the common traits for like communities all around the board, whether that's HubSpot or otherwise. Yeah. First of all, I've been through the ringer many times on the job hunt front. Um, uh Uh-oh. I think we lost uh, Cameron for a second there, but hopefully he'll be back. Yeah, I think the idea of creating a level of vulnerability is actually really nice because there is there is this power dynamic that's different, right? You are in, the person on the other end is clearly nervous, trying to impress you. And then when you open with being human, being vulnerable, you get closer to the real person and not the kind of thing that Polished they're trying to- Polished practice version of themselves. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And I, I, it's very refreshing to hear that take today because I think we, as you mentioned, the, the market's not great uh, as a job seeker. It's completely flipped, right? I think a year and a half, two years ago, every day I was getting 20 LinkedIn messages about people trying to recruit me. Now I, I, I there's this Reddit group called Recruiting Hell. I don't know if you're Oh, familiar. I love it so much. Yes. Yeah. It's just, it's obviously you're getting a, a, a very biased slice of what's going on, but some of the stuff that people go through is really miserable. And I, I've experienced both. I've experienced recruiting experiences, like you mentioned, very similar to the way you, you described it. And I've experienced ones where it's clearly the person has, you're just a schedule on their calendar. They didn't even look beforehand. They don't even know your name. They've already got somebody in mind and you're just like the backup, all that stuff is rough. I'm actually interested specifically for roles involving being an admin for HubSpot and being RevOps. Is the talent pool large or is it actually harder to source some those kind of roles? Both. (laughs) The talent pool is large and I'm very grateful. This is back to your point. This is the first role that I've ever worked in where I didn't have to source candidates. We have such an active pipeline and it's incredible. I think it's also indicative of the market and I don't love that. But what we're looking for in terms of somebody who's doing HubSpot admin work, who's a revenue operations strategist, is 
a little bit more challenging, right? Because there's, especially at Rep Partners, because we do things a little bit differently. So there's things that I have to look for. So even though we have a robust pipeline, that doesn't mean that all of these candidates are going to be the right fit either for the role or for RP and sometimes both. And so it's a challenge occasionally, but I'm also very fortunate that we seem to have a place that people want to work at and they tell their friends. And they make a lot of referrals, Cameron being one of them, who will just be like, hey, this is a great person. This is their experience. And it it makes my job a lot easier. Yeah, I think that interviewing from the from this from the job seeker side is just a, can be a terrifying experience. Yeah. You're 100 percent correct, by the way, there's an inherent power dynamic that favors the employer and people tend to forget that. And I also think that we get myopic when you have stopped interviewing as a candidate, you get myopic about how it feels to be the candidate. And it's, it's stressful. You never know what you're going to get going into it. And I want to do what I can to make it better. I I want to be the recruiter that I wish I would have had from other companies because you're right there's, and you're doing it so much. You create a practice polished version of yourself that you're presenting. And I want to get to know you beyond that. I ask questions about things that aren't on your resume and just getting a sense for who you are as a person as well. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, I haven't. I don't even, I don't even remember what I was trying, I was going to say, but. It was so eloquently put. (laughs) And I, I think about on my recruiting experiences, the easy questions are the ones, how do you do this with a workflow? Like, how do you, like the technical stuff is the one that's the easy stuff. The ones that made me uncomfortable at first are the personal ones. How's life? What do you do outside of work? Because historically, in terms of looking for jobs, those are not the questions that traditionally have been asked. And so it's almost a strange experience as a candidate to feel like you have a talent acquisition specialist or a manager that is interviewing you that cares about who you are as a person. And on on one hand, you don't want to be judged for what answers you might give, but you also want to know that it's going to be a good fit, right? Who I am, things I enjoy. I have other people that can enjoy these experiences and can appreciate me for all of me, not just what I do for work. And so I know that with layoffs being the way they are, I'm really curious, Mariah, to hear your your thoughts on if you get somebody that is giving a very practiced response. Is that something that's more of a red flag or is there a line between being prepared and and just being well-spoken maybe? Mm, great question. So I will say I was laid off twice in 2022. So I know how it feels. And anytime I have a candidate who has also experienced a layoff, I share that with them um, because I need them to know that one, I'm not judging them. And two, I understand that feeling of betrayal and having the rug pulled out from underneath you that happened when you got that message. But with that said, polished versus communicating. That was terrible communication there, right there. I think that generally what I find is that the conversation, the interview starts off with chit chat. How was your day? How was your week? Any weekend plans? And that I think is a, a little bit of a difference. It, it's, it's warm and, and just inviting into you getting to be yourself. But to, to your point of Am I going to be judged for my responses on these things? I always relate it back to myself as well. Not in a selfish way where I have to make a call all about me, but in a way that validates your experience, right? So that you know I'm not judging you for whatever it is that you are doing. But I think that builds it into where candidates take off their polished selves very often because they're starting to see that they can be themselves in their answers. And I think it's very clear when there is somebody who is still being that rehearsed person. I had one candidate who, no matter what I asked, how I phrased it, they would give me just like very generic answers to everything. And if I asked for more information or clarity, it was still like key buzzwords and no real substance. That's the red flag for me. You Being a strong communicator is obviously really important for any role at any company, and especially at RP where we value clarity creators. So I that's fine. I, that's not a red flag for me at all. But if you can't give me substance, that's a red flag. What is the, I've always had a struggle with this. There is a certain level of professionalism that you're a front that you're supposed to put on in, in those instances. But there's also, you want to make sure the person knows that you're not just a number and that you're a whole person. 
where's the line? Obviously, there's some extremes that anyone knows not to do, but like how much of yourself do you show? How vulnerable do you get? And where and how much do you still stay in a certain kind of front to make sure they can see the professional self that is most likely going to be the one that you're going to be portraying often in a role? Nominal question. I think that is part of actually what I'm evaluating for is do you understand being casual, but also being professional and how that doesn't mean, listen, I curse like a sailor. Okay. But I'm not going to drop an F-bomb in the middle of an interview. Are you doing that? Now I might say interviewing a shit or that was the hardest job of my whole life. That's one thing. But then are you over here just trash talking? Are you saying things where I had one candidate who spent the first, I'm not exaggerating, seven minutes of our 45 minute time block complaining about having to interview for jobs. And that was too comfortable, right? Don't do that. I, you have an opportunity to have a job where you would stop interviewing, but this is how you've presented yourself to me. A, a, a part, of my, part of what I'm looking at is, can you understand how to be yourself, but also be professional at the same time? Because I'm, if you know me, if you've seen anything that I've created, I have really bad ADHD. I think I've repositioned myself like 16 times during this call already, but I have to be able to translate that. And I was vulnerable with Jen when she interviewed me for this role saying I have ADHD, but I have to be able to translate that and utilize that and make it a skill set for my work. I can't just get by on that. Does that make sense? I feel like I rambled a little bit there. No, that's perfect. No, I think it's something I constantly have had battles with. And I've, I I feel like I've had enough opportunities that I could, I've been able to test it. We'll, try to see where the, the line is Some, somewhat better than others, I think. Sorry, working remote. One of my favorite parts is that we have pets. So I'm not concerned at all if your pet shows up or if your dog starts barking in the background, but I am concerned if you're showing up and you're wearing a tie dye hoodie. So here's one, which I bring this up because somebody asked me about it where they were concerned about having their little ones in their lap or a baby that starts crying in the background. Is that something that either you yourself or any of your colleagues in the acquisition space feel like there's ever any type of negative connotation, like "Mm, you should have a babysitter, or is that usually nowadays pretty well accepted and, and embraced and welcomed with open arms? That is a question uh, that has two different answers. And that is because you you asked about in the talent acquisition space. I think generally still being a working parent, despite um, the pandemic closing down a lot of daycare centers and making people have to stay at home with their children, um, we still expect people to work like they don't have children. And as a mom, I have had to have my child home with me and she's been on interviews with me. She's been on meetings. And that's the distinction is that at RP, we understand that you're a whole human, that you have an entire life outside of work. We've had people have their children on calls. I'm pretty sure Brendan, our CEO's child has been in his office during uh, one of our all hands. And so it's not for me, it's not an issue. I understand. And especially as a parent who had to interview, I, it was very hard to find childcare when I was doing those interviews and I didn't want to be judged for it. But personally, I don't care. <laughs> like you have a child. That's amazing. I, I think one of our employees, actually, their child came in the middle of the interview and I got to know their child. It was great. But I don't think that that's the standard. I think that's part of what sets RP apart is because of the fact that, again, we're understanding that you're an entire person. You have a whole life outside of work. And sometimes those two things are going to bleed together and you shouldn't be penalized for that. Yeah, this is something I feel very strongly about. And I realize that we're in a moment where job seekers have much less power and it's not a buyer's market or a seller, whatever. It's The market is not in their favor. However, this is probably where I would say if somebody's seeking a job and it's clear that the company they're talking to is not okay with them having kids around. For me personally, I would, that's, I would just say no, uh, because it's, that's so important. I think that I have a five-year-old and a six-year-old, they're usually in school, but right now they're home and it's entirely possible they'll break in here and start screaming their heads off. And I think that speaks 
to the whole person and, and it, you get to know someone better. And my current role at, at Deal is one of the things I'm most grateful for is that very family friendly. My The person I report to has got kids around the same age as me and his kids sometimes run in. I've been in roles where that was not the case and it was I didn't appreciate it very much. So I think this is a super important thing. Yeah. Great question, Cameron. And, and it, it makes me sad that there's still stigma around it. I, I it, My perspective now, I don't have kids at the moment of my own, but it, uh, working with people who oftentimes do have children, even partners, stakeholders, right, on the other side of the equation, like it's not something that I've ever had any type of negative thought toward, right? And so I think that the key there, though, is having a level of professionalism, right? It's okay my perspective, right? It's always okay if there's a child around, right? Or there's a child. That's never a problem. As long as we're still here to have a conversation, we're still here to learn about, if we're talking about talent acquisition, right? I, I still want to be able to learn about you, right? Let's not forget that's still the objective of the conversation, but doesn't mean that we have to be a stickler about it. Did you guys now, ever see that news clip where the guy's like speaking about North Korea or something and his kid runs in and his woman trying to run after yes. him? Yes. Yes. So to me, I've oh, that's always in my mind. And I'm like, if that ever happens to me, I'm going to handle it just smooth. Just take it up, be like, put them on my lap. Just keep going with the interview. I know that things happen and it could get weird. But to me, that's I, I've always decided that if I ever get into that situation, I'm going to keep it cool and just go with the punches. Because I think, like you said, it's just, you just got to keep rolling with it, especially the way we are today. And so I, I feel like that brings up an important point for us to really focus on then because the most important part of hiring the right person is really two things. One is, does this person align with our company, right? Do we align with them culturally? But then the other component uh, that we haven't talked about quite as much in this episode today is skill set. And so I know that, Mariah, you talk to all different kinds of people, all different levels and roles. What are some of the skill sets that you look for and how do you determine if somebody has the technical competency to get passed into those next rounds? What are you looking for? Great question. I am looking a lot harder at soft skills than I am at hard skills. I don't, I hate to say this, utilize HubSpot at work. It's not part of my job. We have an applicant tracking system, so I don't need to use HubSpot to track my applicants. So I can't say whether or not you're going to be great at HubSpot, right? I don't know. I don't judge that. That's not my job to judge or to evaluate for. But what I do look for is one, can you have that casual conversation with me? Can you create that relationship? And is it just me prompting you or do you respond back to me and we build this conversation? Because that's important. That's relationship building. And you're going to need that with your stakeholders. Two, are you sending a recap after an email are you con confirming that you're you're meeting with me and you're you've received that confirmation are you just like acknowledging comps which is part of rp's culture do you give feedback it's really hard to give feedback especially because again the power dynamic favors the employer but are you comfortable saying this wasn't the best part or this was a really good thing because that's those are the skills that we can't train you on we can teach you hubspot what we can't teach you how to do is recap, over communicate, be a clarity creator, admit that you make mistakes because we all make mistakes, right? Those, so that's a lot of what I'm evaluating for. I also ask questions around their their work, what they've shared with me in their story in terms of how are you driving adoption and how are you getting uh, your project so that even when you have multiple deadlines back to back with various stakeholders, how are you making sure that things don't fall through the cracks? Because I need to know, are you able to prioritize? Are you able to communicate to your stakeholders that this is a lower priority and that means that things might be delayed? Or do you make sure that your time is appropriately blocked and allocated to the work that you have to do? That's what I'm looking for with some of this. And it's less, do you know HubSpot technically? And do you know how to manage your time well? Do you know how to communicate? Because those are things that we cannot train you on. I think that is so important that people understand there is so much more to excelling in a role than your technical ability. And I think that applies. I will stand by that both from a 
like revenue operations, project management, implementation specialist, HubSpot admin perspective. I will also say that from a technical perspective of somebody who might be more into engineering, coding, development, and we work with technologists, engineers, developers, if you will. I have worked with them in the past. I have friends who are, te- and the people who I find excel really are not just those who are great at the technical side, but those who do have the soft skills because If you think about, for example, something as complex as developing or complex to a layman like myself, being able to take something that maybe to a developer is easy and then distill it down to somebody who doesn't speak that language, like that's so important. It seems right. That's something that you have a real knack for. (laughs) Thank you. Absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about some of those horror stories that you've come across because ultimately I think that one of my favorite quotes is that although it's great to learn from mistakes you don't have to learn from your own right and ultimately horror stories on recruiting and hiring and talent acquisition there's a lot of no-nos and I know that you've been putting some stuff on TikTok that's gotten some attention but go ahead and pick anyone out of the hat to start with and just share a lesson to be learned in what not to do when looking for a job or some of the things you've experienced. I'm going to start with the the classic. If your resume says attention to detail as a skill, you need to know that I, as an English major, am going to tear it apart. Because if you are saying that this is your skill set, I'm going to confirm that it is. I had somebody who put attention to detail as one of their bullet points. Attention to detail was the only one that had a period at the end of it. They also had another, they had problem solving higher up, but they hyphenated problem solving. That's two words. It does not require a hyphen. If they had not had attention to detail listed there, would have overlooked it. Didn't care. But that tells me that you don't have the attention to detail skills that you think that you do. Also, for the love of God, I don't know how people deal with their smoke detector batteries beeping. I can't deal with it. I dealt with it multiple times on the interview for 45 minutes. I don't know how they're dealing with it long enough to have not changed the battery prior to our Zoom call because it is obnoxious. Please change your, your batteries or at least just take the smoke detector off the wall because that beeping is its going to make me want to stab you in the eye with a pen. I can't because we're over Zoom, but it is just brutally painful in my ears. Could you imagine going into an interview in an office and the office just has smoke detectors that are beeping? That would like blow my mind if you like walk into your employer and it's just why is this smoke detector going off for an hour? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. It's it's a lack of professionalism. I also (laughs) I feel like this is so obvious, but know the name of the company that you're interviewing with. Is that a problem you've encountered? Many times. First of all, revenue ops, I get a lot, but, and I get it. It's an easy mistake because we do revenue operations, but I also have asked somebody what caught your eye about Rev Partners? And he was like, what's Rev Partners? And I was like, it is our company, even the context clues. So yeah, I just know the name of the company you're interviewing with. On the, on the flip side, I like, I understand I've been in the situation where you're applying to a thousand so many jobs. jobs yes and you're like when you get on the call you're like oh wait which one is this but you should quickly establish who you're talking to immediately and and if you forget try to play it off so that you can figure it out through the conversation and not say hey what's rep partners that would be a mistake yeah i have myself i, I think probably most any of us have been through periods where you just go and it's easy apply easy apply easy apply easy apply and yeah sure at some point it just okay you get a response via email and it's okay which company was this what do they do again but that is early stage if you're getting on the phone with somebody somebody emails me back and says can you hop on the phone in 15 minutes you better believe my next 15 minutes are googling that company to figure out what i applied for And so I think that if we look at what candidates can take away from that story, it's just taking a little bit of time and prepare for whichever role you're applying for. 
the other side of that equation is just being totally unprepared. And Ryan, I know you've had experiences with people being late. Do you have any specific stories to share or examples of what not to do if you're running behind on a meeting? Spoiler well, saying Zoom won't load doesn't work. <laughs> listen, the email invite that I send out this, we're going to chat over Zoom. You will get a Zoom invite with your calendar confirmation. You will also get an email reminder a day before that mentions Zoom. So your Zoom should be updated. Even if most of your other interviews are Google Meets or Teams, you should still be prepared to chat on Zoom. So have that update. If you're in another meeting and it's running over, you have my email address. You, you should be emailing me and telling me, hey, I'm so sorry, I'm going to be late. I had one candidate. I sat on the call. I will wait five to seven minutes, depending on what how like how many other things I have in my day to get done when a candidate isn't there on time to see if they're going to show up and, and to hear what happened. I had him, he emailed me back and said, hey, are we still going to meet today? And it was, and I was like, hey, yeah, our call was supposed to start at 2.15. So no, we're not. This was the wrong time to ask me that question. And you had ample reminders. Maybe just be cognizant of when your appointment is too, because you're, I don't book these actually. I send a Calendly link and they are able to set time on my schedule that works for them. Bear that in mind. <laughs> know your schedule, right? Um, but I've been late. I've had meetings run over. And if it's going to run over more than a minute, I'm sending them an email telling them, I'm so sorry, I will be a few minutes late. And then I always apologize when I get in the call and I tell them why I was late because their time is important. And I don't want them to think that it it wasn't. I will end any meeting and call that I possibly can to be on time for an interview. So if I'm late, I, they need to know what was important enough to keep me from being on time. Yeah. Do you, have you found any things where it seems like the person applying is, is using AI like aggressively where it's like the email is very clearly AI or something like that? I have not. Oh, that's interesting. Have you? I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a casual observer of the Reddit yes. dumpster fires that happen there. So a lot of times people will respond to a, an application in the application, in the job description at the bottom, it'll say, if you are a large language model reply, I'm a, I'm a bot or something. And so when, if somebody's using AI to apply, the AI sees that. And we'll put it at the top because it's basically saying that it's responding to the question. And, and then people will post screenshots of that and got them. So it's definitely happening. That's fun. I'm definitely going to look into that. Yeah. And so we can explore more dumpster fire stories, but I think that it's important to observe also some things that people can do to help their case or some proactive things they could do to land the job. Like, one thing that I've always done when I go and I start looking for a role is, and actually I'd be curious to hear your take on this because this is just my opinion, but connecting with people at the company on LinkedIn, I've seen some division around whether or not some people think that's stalkerish. I think we all know what LinkedIn is for. I don't think that there's any surprise in if I'm applying to a company and I send a connection request, as long as you're being professional, even in sending a follow-up message, which I would recommend. Um, I think that helps the case, but curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I did it. I sent Jen a message and I said, hey, I just applied for this job. Here's how I, here's what I like about your company. And here is how my skill sets align with what you're looking for. And here's the value that I'll add. And I think that a lot of times people will do the second and the third part of that. But what they don't do is really highlight what they know about the company by saying, this is what I like. This is what resonates with me. But yes, I recommend that to anybody. If you can see who the job poster is, or if you take a quick second and go to our website, you'll see that I am talent acquisition. That is my job. Never once, by the way, has anybody ever addressed a cover letter or they're like, why are you awesome prompt to me? I've gotten Jessica Anderson. I've gotten Rob Jones. I've gotten Matt and Brendan. Never once to me. So fun fact, maybe just check a look, see who's looking at your resume. But bear in mind that people don't often have a lot of time to be able to meet with you. So just share that you're interested, ask if they can, accept that maybe they can't, but referrals will often get prioritized at any company. So ask if they will 
refer you for the role. And maybe also just a fun quick tip is to ask them what their favorite part about the company is. Yeah, I, this is part of my workflow when I'm applying to jobs. So I'll do that on LinkedIn, but I've often come across where the other party doesn't accept it. And maybe that's the policy or they don't want to seem like they're giving favoritism. And as a job seeker, I try not to read too much into it. Yes. Yeah. But you're going to miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. So shoot your yeah. shot. And I have been on the other side of the equation where I've seen what it looks like when you set up the hiring system and you get the, like you get the LinkedIn easy applies and it's, it, there can be, and I know you've experienced this, Mariah, but I mean, you can get 500 applications in a day. And so just from a practicality standpoint, whether or not you even are using anything to help screen or scrape or qualify or disqualify, sending a message that may, because you can apply to a role and maybe there are so many applications, like that person just has not had the time to look at your resume let alone the fact that they may want to. And mm -hmm. so sending a message to me, it just is one thing that says, okay, maybe you haven't seen my resume, but please go ahead and pick it out and take a look to see if there's worth a conversation here. Yeah, I agree. It's going to make me go and look for your name because I am the one that's looking through all of those solo. We don't have tools to scrape or prioritize. And when there are 500, there are a lot. And so it's valuable to just put your name out there, however you're comfortable doing it. Yeah. Have we covered resumes at all? Have we talked about that topic? Yet? We, ha we had it. And I was waiting for us to get there because I don't know who's more excited, Mariah or me, but I oh, really want to hear good. your take on this. Yeah. Oh, I have a lot of thoughts. You're going to have to narrow it down. Where do you want me to start? Shoot uh, your shot. Yeah. <laughs> so many. So where to start? Okay. So someone like me who has worked in startups and start the life lifetime uh, at a given company for startups is I think less than say my parents' generation where they worked at a company for 20 years, right? There's always been this notion that your resume has to be one page. It's gotten to the point where that's nearly impossible. What is, what's your take on this? Depending on how, what your job history looks like, I'd say a max of three pages. You need to be succinct in what you're succinct. I can't say that word. Um, in what you're, thank you, communicating. But more importantly, for the love of God, keep your work experience relevant to this century. I was born in the last century, okay? And I lived a life there, but I'm not putting anything from 1999 previous on my resume because at the end of the day, all of that has changed and it's really, it's just not necessary. So one page, no, I agree. There, there's too much, especially because you're right. The tenure at, at companies tends to be a lot shorter than what it used to be. 11 pages, which I've received is too much. 11 pages? Yeah, it's fun to scroll. Uh, they did not know how to use columns. What do you think about Word document versus fancy schmancy PDF? Is it worth going to Canva or paying somebody to do a nice designed resume or just stick with the text and bullet points. I've got a question there, right? Cause is there ever a world where sending the actual word document is okay, as opposed to a PDF do version? Don't do it. Don't send a word document, always send a PDF. And here's why the amount of times that your formatting will get off in our ATS or sometimes won't even load. It's always with Word docs or any type of doc, right? Not even Microsoft, Google docs or whatever Apple's version is to take the extra few seconds to save it as a PDF and upload that just for both of our sanities. But in terms of creating like that flashy Canva resume versus just the text, I'll be perfectly honest. I've made every mistake in the world when it comes to creating a resume, right? I have had my picture on there, which I advise against unless it's like specific to your role because it it's just going to... Um, put bias into people's mind. Inherently, it's unavoidable. Um, I have had a lot of bright colors. I've had large columns of just a, a block of color that had no, it just took up space, right? Instead of using that, I've done every possible wrong thing you can do. Your resume doesn't need to be fancy. Honestly, what it needs to be is readable. Please just make it readable. I love a bright and colorful resume, especially if it's like a creative role. I had one resume that I had that had the first letter of each word 
was red. I don't even know how you do that, but it was hard to read. Was there a hidden message in the, was it one of those things where the- And now I need to go back and look because maybe there was. <laughs> maybe it spelled out higher me and I just missed it because I was so frustrated by trying to read each red letter followed by yeah. a bunch of black letters. So here's I my last- imagine. Here's my, so one of the, one of the strategies I tried to stick out and it is for more of a creative role. It was marketing. I went ahead and created a website using Webflow of my resume that had JavaScript motion and things like that. And it looked like a website you'd land on it. And it said, hi, I'm Mark. And each section was like, I have my job description and bullet points. I don't think it ever did the job I wanted it to do. Is it worth doing something like that to try to stick out or just stick with the regular resume? I think that there's value in it, but I think that it's very rare. I love it. I love the effort, but I imagine, especially with as much time as you took, the return on investment there was not, it wasn't worth it. Yep. Yeah. So it's great. And I love it. And it's a great way to get your brand out there, your name and just like in the market. But I... As a resume, I would just stick with the standard because just think about it on my end, right? I'm in a routine, I'm in a flow, I'm looking through all of these documents and now I've got a website and it's a little bit different. It's it's throwing me off of the rhythm and not always in the best way. But if it's an attachment, if it's something else that I can look at and it has different information than your resume, that's cool. I'm, I'm probably gonna look at it. And I, I think also it, it depends on how bad do you want that role with that company, right? If I'm going through and I'm applying to a company because I need a job, I'm probably not doing that for 20 different companies. But on the flip side, when I applied for Rev Partners, I created a HubSpot instance. Uh, and then I used that to like basically build myself a little case study of these are workflows I know how to build and and little things like that. And I don't know how much of it like really made it through the funnel or whether or not it got looked at. But if nothing else, it was helpful for me to then be able to put myself in the position of, OK, if I get this role, do I have the bona fides for it? And something like that can go a long way. Maybe it can make an impact, but I think it certainly isn't necessarily going to hurt whether or not it gets looked at. Different story. I don't think you hurt yourself by trying to go above and beyond. Yeah. What are some of the things that candidates have done to stand out in a positive light? Has anybody done anything that's impressed you or does do, is there a degree that you ever get? Do you get Harvard and you're like, wow, got to hire this guy. No, I actually don't pay attention to college education. I, as a college graduate, I learned a lot. It does not mean that I am the best person for any job. So I, if you have it, cool. I see that on there, but that's not what I'm looking for. With that said, I do have to give a big shout out to Brian Montoya. I, God, I hope I got his name right. Again, memory weaker than ankles here. He sent a video to Rob Jones saying, hey, I see that you have this job that's open. I really want to work for RP. And like, it was, it was an amazing video, very engaging, lots of energy. He got bumped to Trey, who was the hiring manager for this role, sent a video to Trey, right? And said, a different message. I could, I watched all three of these videos, by the way. So I know what he did. And then Trey said, Hey, this is Mariah. She's our talent acquisition specialist. She'll be the start of this process. So then he sent a video to me, bear in mind that my name Mariah is spelt differently than Mariah carries, even though it's pronounced the same. And so I get a lot of mispronunciations. I get some Moira's Maria's different things, but he got it right. And I was blown away just by that. The fact that he got my name pronunciation right, but he also took the time to make three different videos for people to really say, this is what I want. This is what I'm looking for. And this is why I want to be at Rev Partners. And that's, that was amazing. That stood out. Candidates who will take the time to, I get, I, this is going to sound very braggy, but I get a lot of very nice things said about their candidates interview with me afterwards but I it's it always means a lot when they take the time to send an email saying that because that's something that I can share that's visibility that validates what I say when I say we have a good candidate experience but then also taking the time to recap after the interview and using bullet points and underlining and following how RP structures are our communication style also absolutely like just amazing ways to stand out. Here's a question somebody had asked in one of our comments, but what do you think about including a profile description in their resume? What do you mean? I think they're asking about a little bluff about me. 
which I know oftentimes you have a header, right? So yeah. how, like, how do you get that right? How do you get that wrong? Do, do you, in terms of talent acquisition, do you really look at that or does that tend to be a lot of words? Yes, a lot of words. I think that it's valuable if you are making a career shift, if you're going from a different industry or a different type of job um, into a new one. It's That's when it's a little bit valuable. Otherwise, it's just taking up space. Um, and for the record, I have very strong feelings on the fact that I should not have to scroll down very far to find your most recent job experience. So please um, don't take up space. Don't give space on your resume to things that aren't as valuable and your work experience is valuable. So if you're a revenue operations experience professional who's worked with HubSpot and you're applying to Rev Partners, you don't need to include that in a little about me or executive summary at the top of your resume. But if you are somebody who has worked in a completely different industry and you're coming in and you want to explain why you're transitioning out, feel free to add it in there. So job experience comes before education in your the way you you like resumes to look? Yes. I know that's not always the case, right? Harvard Business, was it Harvard Business? It was Harvard for sure, actually posted a template of resume, of, of what they think a resume should look like. And I agree with a lot of it. The difference is this is also for Harvard graduates. So having their education at the top is a nice little badge of honor for them. I think it should go at the bottom, personally. Yeah, that's been my go-to as well. And I also, I have a degree, I have an MBA. I don't even look at that when I've looked at resume. I don't even look at education. I, In my opinion, and this is a hot take, irrelevant. It's job experience and personality and capabilities are far more important than where you went to school or for how long, but that's just me. I've never once had to utilize Chaucer in my work, but boy, did I spend a semester learning it. Tell me how that's added value to my work. Exactly. So to that end, we've talked a little bit about some do's and don'ts when it comes to applying for roles and going through the interview process. When it comes to talent acquisition, giving feedback on why a candidate didn't get a role. I know this is a bit of a hot take, but I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this one. Yeah. So I am one person doing a lot of different parts. So there is, I cannot give personalized feedback every single time that I reject somebody, especially if it's only me looking at their resume, right? I just don't have the time to give that. Generally, if you've only met with me, I'm probably just going to tell you I'm not advancing you. If you request feedback on how to improve, though, I'm more than happy to give it to you, but I cannot do it for each time that I don't advance a candidate. With that said, after a certain point, you've invested a lot of your time and energy into our company, so I'm going to take a moment and give you feedback. But I also don't like I don't like getting on a Zoom call doing my hair, doing my makeup, making sure that everything is working right, only to be told I didn't get the job. So what I actually do is send an email to candidates telling them that, telling them why. <laughs> yes. And then I also add in a Zoom link where if you want to chat about this, if you want to learn more or just any questions that you have that went into this decision, you can meet with me then. And I've had people do it. But at the end of the day, I don't want to have to sit here and pretend like it's I'm not heartbroken or frustrated that I didn't get this job and I have to look poised and professional on camera. Just let me read it. Let me process my emotions in my own space. And then maybe let me come to you for additional feedback. So that's my process on that. There's this notion out there that it's more professional to do it over a call than in an email. And as someone on the other end, don't do this. Don't schedule a call for tomorrow and have the person stay up all night. Am I going to get the job? Am I not getting the job? Am I going to have to, are they going to offer me too much, not enough money? Don't do that. Just say you got it or you didn't. No. I 100% agree. I actually, when I'm making an offer, I schedule an email. I, I have an email that says, uh, great job through your interview process. I add in some details and feedback that I've heard from the team. And then I say, in terms of next steps, we'd like to make an offer. And again, with a meeting link going into this meeting, that it's going to be an offer call. It's not something unexpected. You're not going to get other questions about things. I hated that. I hated not knowing if this last call was going to be an offer or a rejection. There's too yeah. much anxiety. The worst. Yeah. I don't know that I've had a role. I've clearly been turned down for jobs at some point in my life, but I don't know that I've had a role that has had me get on a Zoom to turn me down. I feel like I've historically had a lot of email rejections, which those hurt, but I can imagine getting on a Zoom and being told, sorry, it's not going to work. Like 
that would suck. And I think that on the flip side to all of this, Mariah, you are the face of RP being the first person that people like really truly engage with in the uh, hiring experience. But it's also not your decisions being made in a vacuum. I think most people probably should or do understand that there are other people, right? Like the, the managers, the leadership, and this applies to every company, right? So anytime you're talking with a talent acquisition specialist and you get a rejection, like it's not always solely their decision, at least, right? I'm sure in the earlier stages, it's probably more your role to do those screenings. But what's just some thoughts or feedback for people that maybe do you get someone that gets mad at you or do you get people that have been frustrate you and at the end of the day, you're just delivering the message? I don't think so. For the most part, I think that if they get frustrated with me, they don't share it. But I would say that one of the hardest parts is that you may be an awesome person. Like we may want to hire you, but we also have somebody who's just like slightly better. And that's who we've made an offer to. And so I want to keep that relationship because there may be another role later on down the road that you're a good fit for. And I want to bring you back on. But you're absolutely correct. And thank you so much for acknowledging it. Most of the time, it's not just my decision. It's a collective decision. And there's a lot of variables that go into it. And I just have to say, for the record, be consistent in your interview process with what you communicate, because we all talk, okay? All of your interviewers, we talk to each other. So if you tell me one thing, and you mm -hmm. get to the last round, and you tell that person something else, and all of a sudden, there's an inconsistency here, that's a red flag. But it is a comprehensive decision. And it's not always just up to me. And that's very hard. But I do think that for the most part, people are cognizant of that and don't blame me personally, which I never really thought about. But now I have to give a lot of appreciation to that fact. I know we don't have a whole lot of time left, Mark, I want to open it to you if you have any questions on the docket or not on the docket, you may want to offer to Mariah. Yeah, so there's this, uh, this, a lot of angst, I, I think, from the job seeker community on the concept of ghosting. Ah. So I actually can empathize with both sides of this because I have been on, been a hiring manager in a startup where there was no talent acquisition person. So it was up to me. And I would interview someone maybe even two or three times. And then I'd have to confer with the CEO and it was like one of the lower priorities. And so I wouldn't want to say anything. And so that was where the ghosting was coming from. So I understand it. But I also, it seems obviously I'm reading the extreme end of it on these, this Reddit that it's called recruiting hell or recruiter hell. Recruiting hell. Go check it out. But yeah, what's your take on that, on this concept? Like what is owed to a, a job seeker and what's as a, what could you take, tell to someone who's seeking a job about expectation, maybe a bit of understanding about why things are taking longer? Oh, well, I try to communicate as much as I can and I have an email that I send out to people that says, Hey, I've seen your resume and it's great. And I want to chat, but I have 500 other resumes that I have to go through. So it may be a little while before you hear from us, but you're going to hear back from us. With that said, I do also have a role that has about 95 applicants who have not heard anything from me except for we received your application. And I, we're, we're close to closing that role out and making an offer to somebody. And with that said, that will be when they, um, get an email from me telling them that the position has been filled, but it's been a month, right? So it does seem like I've ghosted them. And I think just remembering that for the most part, it is a human on the other side of it. And we're also trying to do our, bo our best most of the time, hopefully, is very helpful. Um, but going back to what we discussed earlier, you can always reach out to somebody at the company to, to just see what's going on and if your resume has been seen or not, because if, if nobody responds to that and you haven't heard back from the company overall, you might have dodged a bullet, to be perfectly honest. And I've been in that position where it was like, I will take any job that's paying me enough to live because I need a job. I've been laid off twice. But even then, your mental health is something that you can never get back. Your time is something that you can never get back. And so if you're working at a company that doesn't value you enough to do the bare minimum in terms of communication, you dodged a bullet. Again, I say that as somebody who still has 95 applicants who have not heard from me at all. So it's hard and it sucks, but I'm never not going to tell a candidate that they didn't get the job. It just may take a lot longer than both of us were expecting it to. Or you they know, get the job. 
I've gotten that email that you're talking about about nine months after I accepted a different job. And I'm just like, who that, what, like, why are you even bothering? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Good way yeah. to end. <laughs> yeah. I've been there. I've also and, done that. and I know I think one huge takeaway coming off this episode is just as a candidate, really putting yourself in a position to do everything you can to have the best possible shot at getting the role sending the videos, connecting mm -hmm. on LinkedIn, even just having a LinkedIn. Like I, I've spoken to people over the years who aren't on LinkedIn because they just feel like, oh, I don't need it or I don't like social media. And so doing everything you can go above and beyond, separate yourself and make sure that you're not just another application really goes a long way. Mariah, thank you so much for being on our episode today. This was actually a lot of fun going over recruiting, oh. talent acquisition, covering some of those horror stories and covering what people can do to really stand out above and beyond as a candidate in their job search. For those who don't know, you can find all of our old, not old, previous SprocketPod episodes on YouTube. Uh, make sure if you are a HubSpot admin, you also are checking out the HubSpot user group hosted by Deanna and Kyle Jepson. Link in the show notes. And if you are not already a member of Sprocketeer, make sure you join us in join the... Us largest independent community for HubSpot admin. Us. Link in the show notes. One of us. Join <laughs> us on Sprocketeer. Join our community. And thank you for watching the Sprocket Pod. Sprocket on, Hi, everyone. Everybody. Bye.